As Cheryl was reminding us, our country, our town, and our congregation are increasingly diverse. It's a fascinating time to be alive in the United States, especially here in Southern California. We get to meet new people, enjoy different cuisine and music, and through encountering other cultures, we also get to understand ourselves a little bit better, hopefully. In so many ways, this diversity is a gift. It's also a challenge, though, when we start talking about what we want for our future together. As communities expand and diversify to maintain some common sense of purpose, their dream has to grow bigger, too. That's not just inspirational talk, it's just a matter of logistics. In a homogenous place, where people are mostly the same, the community can be motivated by a common denominator. However, when communities grow bigger and the people in them don't just look different, they also want a wider variety of different things. To have a sense of motivation and purpose, a growing community needs a bigger dream. So today, as much as any time in American history, there are widely divergent opinions about what a good America looks like and what direction we hope the future will lead. This morning, I'm inviting us all to dream big. Create a vision that's big enough to inspire us to action and pull us together as a community. And that phrase, dream big, usually means to be more specific with your wish list or to more fervently commit to those particular things that you so deeply desire. Today, I'm not asking you to dream more specifically or fervently. I'm inviting us to dream more broadly. What's the broadest dream for our future that's still inspiring? How might we paint a picture of thriving that includes as many opinions as possible? Some of you, a handful of you, came of age in a time when the American dream was very clearly defined. It was mostly a material dream. It was promised that if you worked hard and tried, you would have a stable life. The promise of home ownership, a stable job, enough money to raise a family, and usually enough for the mother to stay at home in full-time parenthood. A car and a modest vacation every once in a while were also part of the package. Many of you, though, came of age in a more tumultuous time of the Vietnam War and the assassinations of some of our country's most prophetic leaders. In those decades, the American dream became slightly more elusive. We started wondering if maybe it was a fantasy. It became clear that even if that dream was possible for some, it was reserved for people with the right skin color the right faith, the right gender, and sexual orientation. It wasn't an American dream. It was more a club with some really lovely benefits. So into that moment of a dream being questioned, leaders started pointing in different directions. They critiqued those founding documents and those founding promises as being a little bit bankrupt. Several different dreams emerged, not just kings. The Klan became more outspoken about the dream of a white Christian America. Malcolm X and Black Panthers 
became clear about a dream of amassing power for the black community, conservative Christians began an ardent push for their view of a morally pure America, while feminists raised the audacious dream of equal rights for women. Into that mix, obviously, was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. Rather than the material promise of that post-World War II American dream, King talked about relationships, and particularly racial equality. His dream was beautiful and inspiring. It's still inspiring today. But I have a sense that it may be time for us to dream more together, not just to listen to Dr. King's dream, but to be a part of speaking and building our own. This month for the minister's seminar, several tapestry members read the book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It was a little bit dry, but lots of us got through it. There were a couple of key ideas in that book that I want to explain briefly. One, because I think they're important, and two, because they're kind of what led me into this dreaming big feeling for the week. First is the fact that we humans are not nearly as logical as we like to believe we are. Study after study proves that we humans act primarily out of intuition and our emotional responses. When we use reason, it's mostly to reinforce or to justify our initial emotional reaction. I'll say that again. When we use reason, it's mostly to reinforce or justify our initial emotional reactions. That's a hard pill to swallow. I hated reading the first 150 pages of this book. I was insisting, you don't know me, I'm smart and thoughtful. But over and over again, psychology shows us that we feel before we think. And the feeling almost always dictates our response. The second key piece of this book is built on the first. Because we function mostly out of our emotions, our moral lives, our sense of what's right and wrong is shaped mostly by intuitive feelings. Now through culture and through evolution, we've developed these emotional frameworks that guide us. It's pretty amazing. We're moral before we even have time to think about it. Logic comes way after the fact to justify our feelings. Depending on our culture or our personal experience, again, like Cheryl was mentioning, we are more or less attuned to different values. Maybe a sense of personal freedom is a guiding value, or the sanctity of family is a guiding value for you. Or Doing what's compassionate seems to always be the right answer. Those moral commitments are deeply ingrained in us. So the author of this book argues that these moral intuitions are sort of like different tastes. You know, like through the nerves of our tongues, we have the capacity to appreciate sweet and savory and sour and so on. Similarly, through our basic moral intuition, we have moral tastes. Each of us has the capacity for six basic moral senses. They are compassion, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. So I want you to listen to that list one more time. You probably already gravitated toward one or two and maybe even bristled at a couple of them. 
I'm going to read the list again. I want you to identify which of these moral issues is a priority for you. Loyalty, fairness, authority, liberty, compassion, and sanctity. So the author of this book argues that liberals gravitate toward compassion and fairness, while conservatives focus more on the other four tastes. And this deeply ingrained pre-logical moral map is the source of most of our political disagreement. These moral commitments that are the fruit of culture and evolution are why we sometimes feel like we're speaking different languages about politics and religious issues. Again, it's not an easy idea to swallow. Feeling right feels so good. It takes the wind out of my sails to consider that maybe there is more than my version of right. It seems that to bridge some of the divide in our country, it's time to cast a wider dream of how we might thrive together. Instead of focusing in on one or two flavors of morality that we so love, we'd be wise to embrace a fuller spectrum of values. Most of us can quickly envision a particular vision of the United States that emphasizes our own particular priorities. Compassion and fairness, perhaps, for the liberal dream, or loyalty, authority, and sanctity for the conservative dream. As I was saying before, a dream needs to be broad and inspiring. It won't include everyone probably won't include those who are so committed to their singular moral framework that they have no room for others. But I do think it's possible to dream in a way that is both broad and inspiring. I have a pretty good sense of what I would like our country to look like, and it's probably similar to what you would like it to look like. But I spent some time thinking this week about something more broadly. Here's what I came up with. In the United States, there should be opportunities for bright and hard-working people to exercise their potential. And there should be significant reward for those people who present good ideas and hard work. In the United States, there should be enough food for every person to eat and a place for everyone to call home. Not luxury, but enough to simply be safe. That safety net may be insured by the government, but nonprofits and especially religious organizations based on compassion should have a major role in caring for those most in need. In my dream of the United States, individuals and communities will be free to practice their religion as they see fit. Of course, that practice can't interfere with other people's rights. I dream of a United States where all Americans feel proud and loyal to their country. And a United States that honors the full cultural identity of every diverse person that lives here. I dream of a country where leadership is honored as a gift to the community and where authority is earned through merit and sacrifice. I dream of a United States that honors the sanctity of families and faith communities. 
That includes all families and all faith communities. It's not your perfect dream, I know that. It's not the perfect dream of most of the members of Saddleback Church or the mosque down the street either. It's broad, but hopefully also a little inspiring. With this dreaming big and broadly in mind, I wonder also if we might apply some of that strategy to our congregation. After all, this is meant to be a big tent faith. If we intend for all our neighbors to be welcome here, we might want to build a dream that's a little wider than our own personal inclinations. Here's what I came up with, and I'll email it out so I don't have to say it over and over. My big dream for tapestry is to be a community to build and deepen relationships. We can be a network to provide care for those in need. We can be a workshop to strengthen our faith and ideals, a place to learn to love our neighbors and to be loved as our whole selves. We can be a sanctuary for anyone to encounter the sacred. I know that's a lot. I'm not going to read it again, but as I said, I'll email it, mostly because I want to hear what you think in response. Too often we think of dreams as a way of focusing in, like a laser beam. They might be more fruitful if we instead use them as an opportunity to expand our understanding of the good. That's the way our literal dreams work. When we sleep at night, our minds go a thousand different places. I know mine does. In one night, I may be running from monsters or in all sorts of surreal situations. Maybe we can take a cue from our literal dreams. Our dreams for the future are an opportunity to expand our understanding of the good and to make room for more and more people in the beloved community that we aim to build. Amen.